So let's say that you're opening your mail at home or at work and you get this email, right? A lot of you may have read in around December, January that Europe was voting whether to separate or have England stay part of the European Union or, you know, news, news information. Okay. Uh, this email, this are real emails. What I'm going to share with you today are real emails that happen to real people. Okay, they're not made up emails. So we get an email. What's the first thing you see? CNN Urgent Report, right? It comes from a reputable news organization, right? CNN. Who would think CNN would do anything wrong? Nobody would, right? CNN is a normal, reputable organization, right? And who's on the picture? We all know. Anderson Cooper, right? Everybody knows Anderson Cooper, especially in this day and age. <laughs> They're there all the time, right? Okay, so we want to know more information about this. It could be about, I don't know, Earth Day. It could be CNN having a report on anything, any topic that may pique your interest and you want to click on, right? Yeah. All right. You more than likely not happen to look for where it comes from. <coughs> Okay, more than likely not. You look at the link and you say, oh, let me click on the link so I can read the story. What is the, what is the return email there? Reply at ambistatus.com. Does that sound like CNN? No. It definitely is not CNN. Okay, that's somebody trying to get to your email, trying to get you, and they get your email account that way. Okay? So when you're going to click on an email, you've got to look at all parts of the email not just at the link to click. We're kind of like programming ourselves to just click at the link, right, to be fast. Yeah. You gotta look at the whole email, especially if you don't know where it's coming from. Facebook, I talked about Facebook. Who has Facebook in here? Come on, be honest, be honest. Who doesn't, I should say, right? Or you're familiar with Facebook, right? We all get emails that say, Oh, somebody wants to friend you, right? View your messages, right? People want to friend you. And you get an email, I get an email that says, you know, uh, so-and-so wants to friend you and stuff, and click here. Would you click on that? It's got the blue bar, and it says Facebook. It looks like the Facebook page, right? Doesn't it? <clears throat> okay, look at the top. What does it say? It come, the reply comes from, again, the wrong thing. Eliza. Alar at ganymede.com. Is that Facebook? No. That ain't Facebook. Because if that person works for Facebook, she's going to have a Facebook.com account at Facebook.com, all right? That is not Facebook. So that is somebody, again, trying to get your information, your email account. And we'll talk about why they want your email account. I'm going to show you my most interesting one. Because my son is out of town in college, I'm sure you guys do the same thing. You send packages to them, right? Mm -hmm. I use FedEx or I use UPS or, you know, I'll go to the U.S. mail. When you send a package, what do you do in return? You get an email to tell you that he received it, right? I want to know Danny got the package, right? So I get an email. Does that look official? FedEx number, whatever, 2748. Mm -hmm. It looks like it would be the email I get back, right? Telling me Danny got the package. So I would click to see if he got the package, right? But it ain't FedEx. In this case, it was, I know it's small, egan at emiratesbank.com. Now we're getting serious. Emirates is in the Middle East. Okay, so somebody out there in some little room is trying to figure out, using very legitimate logos, that we can all go to Google Images, copy and paste. That's how easy it is for these people to do this. Okay, they create this that looks so real, but it is not real. Didn't happen to me. This, this came from somebody else. But it could have happened to me. Yeah. Amazon. Who likes to get a free $50 card from Amazon? Yeah. Right? <laughs> How many of you really have gotten an email with a gift card that really found out to be true? Yeah. To be true. No, no. I don't think Amazon is out there saying, oh, for my loyal customers, let me send them a $50 gift card. It ain't. Unless you reached out to them and you're expecting something back. They're not going to go out there. We all want to believe that, like we buy lottery, right? We want to believe that we're going to get that credit, that gift card, and you know it's going to be great. It looks real. It looks Amazon looks like the real logo, right? And it says if you click here, you're going to get a fifty-dollar Amazon card. Oh. Not real. They re 
return email was winningalman.com. That is not Amazon.com at all. Okay, so now they got your email address if you click there. What can they do? Okay, once they got your email, what do we do when we forget the password? Reset. Say forget password, right? There's a thing there to make it easy for us. We say forget password. Now this is the scam. They got your email and you say forget password. So now when the new password or the temporary password comes, he's got your email. So he's going to read that temporary password. He's in like now. All right? Yes? I had somebody back into my email that said that I was in Cyprus. I knew $2,000. You were in Cyprus. Look at that. You went there really quick from crop. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It's real. It's absolutely real. So that's why we got to get educated so they don't get a hold of our information. And I'm going to give you some tips I learned. Uh, so that you also do not become victims of these scams. All right, so what is a real important thing is your password, okay? All of us are mature and our brain cells are starting to light, right? So what do we do? We only create one password, right? And we use that password every day. And on top of that, we make it a real easy password, like one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So we can remember that, trust me. I have to change, I've had to change my ways. But these are the most used passwords according to Computer Magazine, wow. right? In America. How many here have a password that resembles this? Or is this? Nah. Nobody here has this password? Okay. In the other group, I have like three or four hands go on. These are easy because they're easy to remember. Okay? So these are not <coughs> passwords you should use. Okay. Never give out your email password to anyone. Your personal or your professional at work. Everybody that works in the cafeteria has an account. Okay? Whether they know it or not, they do have an account. Whether they let it expire or not, they do have an account that can be reactivated. Okay? So do not give the, the, your password to anyone. Don't use the same password for everything you have. So your credit union account, I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five, six, right? They don't let you do that, but I'm going to say that that's the password for credit union. You use it also for your Visa card, right? Because now you can remember. You also use it for your Yahoo email account. So you're using the same password across your spectrum. What happens? If that hacker got that email and password for one, he can now get in your bank, in your credit card, everywhere else that you are. I hate to say it, but it happens more times than we really would like for it to happen. Remember what I tell you, these people, this is their full-time job. When we're out being good citizens and, and we are abiding, law-abiding citizens, they're out there trying to do this stuff to all of us. Internet is great, but it's also a place we need to uh, approach it carefully and, edu and with education, okay? Um, make sure your email password is strong. What is a strong email password? I was told, okay, don't just make it numbers. Don't just make it letters, okay? Try to make some numbers, some letters, and a symbol, a symbol or two, okay? Don't make it four letters, like you make one, two, deal. Don't make it like four digits, because that's super easy. They also have programs and algorithms that try to figure out common or possible combinations to try to get your accounts. And whoever they get hit, okay, remember, we're talking million of accounts throughout the world, right? Whoever they get hit first, easy. Now they can get into those people's accounts and stuff. Let's not be those easy ones, all right? Never reuse your passwords. So if you use the password, retire it. One way I was told in this presentation to try to remember the password configurations, because who can remember 50 million passwords we have? I know you agree with me. Try to always have like an anchor. Okay, an anchor password, which is, I'm gonna say your dog's name, uh, Fluffy. Fluffy, okay? That's your anchor, F-L-U-F-F-Y, and then change the digits, okay? You can change the digits that you attach to Fluffy and change the symbol. So for every account, it'll be Fluffy, but the numbers and the symbols are different, okay? <coughs> so that either, either that or keep the numbers the same and change the word and the symbol. <coughs> So try to keep something the same so that your brain can kind of like compartmentalize how you're doing it. Have a, a rhythm to that, okay? I don't know if you remember, I am, I have a personal Yahoo email account. Who has a personal Yahoo email account here? 
Raise your hands. Okay. I, I was okay. Did you change your password since September 22nd? Did you go in your Yahoo email account and change your password? Who did? Why? Because, and they're sending you emails, people. <laughs> when you get an email from your actual account company, follow. 500 million Yahoo accounts, email accounts were hacked. They got emails, well, hopefully they didn't, but they supposedly got a list, some hacker somewhere in the world, with 500 email accounts, but not only the email account, because you know when you put your email account, you put your date of birth, you know, you have a password associated to that, etc., etc. right? So, the minute you leave the meeting today, if you have a Yahoo account, I did it that day, I listened to the news, I got like an alert on my phone. You know how sometimes you get alerts on your phone? Okay. And on my way, I was on, a, on my way to a meeting, I stopped a minute and I changed my password immediately. Because what do they do? What I just told you. They got your email. They click change password. They get the they get the email because they know your email. They get the interim email and they're in like flame. We don't know yet, or they the press has not reported if there have been actually fraud done from the Yahoo account, but you're getting emails, I know I got emails, change your password, and not only change your password, make it strong, like we talked, and add a security question. A lot of now websites are asking for a security question or image, all right? Yeah. Do it. Credit Union asks for an image. The bank my son uses up in, uh, where he's in college has an image. So go to the securities tab of your, especially your financial stuff, okay? Your important stuff, social security. You know, everybody here maybe has a social security account that you check your social security so we can drink and we talk, right? <laughs> Make sure you're secure in that kind of stuff, right? Your banks, your credit cards, etc. Pandora. I know many of you like to put Pandora to have in the background when you're doing paperwork and stuff. A lot of accounts were hacked also, not long ago. Who cares? They care. Because if the password you use in Pandora is the same password you use at the credit union, it got you. And you should hear the stories about the credit union and the hacking and the fraud that goes on with credit cards and impersonation of identifications. Right? Lots, lots of problems. Okay, so they will try to use you, they will try to steal your username and passwords from other websites. And then try to, in, in hopes they're going to discover these credentials and go to Visa, you know, the common ones. MasterCard, Visa, American Express, etc. Or your banks, local banks, and then find your financial information. Okay. Who recognizes this little piece of equipment is what? It's a router. Thank you. A lot of us have it at home, right? So you can be with your laptop in the kitchen, and your son can be with a tablet in the room and your husband or significant other could be on the desktop, right? So you can have mobility in the house, right? You don't have to have wires. Okay, in order to install a router, you have to put a user ID and password, right? Yeah. Eric, what's the user ID and password for installing a Wi-Fi router? Admin and password. <laughs> That's the user ID, admin, and the password is the word password. And that comes in the manual for installing the Wi-Fi's, okay? Who can get that? You Google it, you go to YouTube, it even gives them instructions how to do it, right? For us, for law-abiding people, we may need to go there to see how we're going to fix, figure it out, right? But they do it because they know that's what everybody does and people don't change the password. So if you have a router in your house, I recommend this weekend go and change your password, okay? If you have a baby camera, if anybody here has a baby camera in the baby's room or security cameras, they work on Wi-Fi as well. All right, so they're, they're attached to your Wi-Fi router. Again, you need to protect the password, change the password. Ransomware. What is it? Somebody knows what this is? Has anybody been a victim of this? Okay, my daughter was. I, I, I had heard about this, but I, I actually experienced it. Um, when she graduated high school, my sister gave her a laptop. Okay, a laptop so she could go to Miami Dade for college, right? So she was setting up her laptop. As she's setting up her laptop, a great big red box comes in the middle of the screen that says, we have taken a hold of your files, something to this effect. Unless you pay $49.99, we're not going to 
and release the files to you. Like stuff she had put on her laptop and, and things. So she comes from, and she is pretty computer savvy. But obviously she went in some website, she didn't check where she was going, and it got a hold of her computer IP address, and it got a hold of it, and, and that's, and what they do is they take it hostage, unless you pay. So she comes out of the room crying, oh God, look at this, song, you know. It was like 10 o'clock at night, it gave you a number to call, so you call, you give the credit card, $49.99, and I paid it. I was lucky they released the files, okay? That was fraud. They were committing fraud. It wired out in the open. In the prior group, we had two managers. They were told to go to 7-Eleven and put $200 or their files would not be released. Two of them. And they had to do it. Now, I'm going to tell you what a friend of mine did. And in this case, they released the files. Sometimes you pay and they don't release the files. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you what a, a very smart friend of mine did. I didn't think that, but I should have done it, thought of that before. But I'm going to pass it on to you. Because they're con artists who's doing this. They're criminals, okay? What he did, it happened to him, and then he says, yeah, they told me $49.99. That must be the amount. It has to be under 50 for some reason, I think, because a lot of that is very common. So he paid it. They released the files, and guess what he did after? God darn it. He canceled the payment. He canceled the transaction. I didn't think of that, so I still... They did take my 50 bucks. So they released, the, they released his files and he immediately called the credit card and canceled the transaction. So they didn't get his 50 bucks. So I'm telling you, so if it happens to you, outsmart the criminal. Okay, so anyways, more importantly, don't go into websites you don't need to go into. Okay, what to do? Become educated about computer security. What we're doing, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what's out there. Don't write your passwords on sticky notes. How many of you do that? You put your password on sticky note, and then what do you put it? On the monitor, right? Yeah. You put the password right on the monitor. And we write the word user ID and password on top of it. So we make it super easy, right? I mean, they're in like Flynn, right? So don't do that. Don't put it underneath the keyboard. Everybody knows the places where we hide. Okay? Be, be secure about it. I know. I've done it, I know, all everything, so. Be, be savvy about it. If you're gonna have to write things down, make sure you write it down, you know where that piece of paper is at all times, if it's in your wallet, with your driver's license or whatever, secure, don't just willy-nilly, okay? At the house or, you know, at work, either way. Don't use public Wi-Fi. If you go to Starbucks or you go to uh, McDonald's that they're public, right? You don't have to put a password. Right? Or my Dunkin' Donuts, somebody said. The airport. Right? Right. Why? Because you, if you're doing like a transaction, right, and somebody's out around, and they are, they're already fishing for your information as well, because they're near you. If your Wi-Fi is not protected, somebody's parked outside your house, and they're accessing your Wi-Fi too, if you're in there in the bank doing something, they got your information. <coughs> All right? That, those are the, re the things you've got to be thinking when you're going to access a public Wi-Fi. Now, if you go to a hotel, they give you a password. Sometimes they put it in the room, right, what the password is. I would think that's protected. I don't trust it too much, but, you know, I would think there's a password, so you're semi-protected. When you're going to do your real important stuff, do it where you know you're really secure. Don't use the same password for all your accounts. We cover that, right? Okay, questions about cybersecurity. I just covered a little bit about it. Okay? All right, for your personal info and for work information. Because when you click on the wrong website at work, we have had instances where this virus takes over the computer and then you can't even put it in breakfast or lunch. It, it just, the guys have to go and remove the malware. Okay, the virus now multiplies in your computer and sometimes that's what they like to do. It's just for the, for the heck of just like creating havoc in the computers. All right, and then you're stuck, you can't put it for breakfast or lunch, now we have a problem. So when you're gonna go on a website, you gotta be sure what website you're gonna go on. Check that it's a secure website, which is HTTPS, okay? Where you see on the bar on the top, you see HTTP. Make sure there's an S there, so it's a secure website, okay? So you know it's something. And even with that, even with all those precautions, we become victims, all right? But at least we can prevent some. Okay, we're good? Cybersecurity done. Now we're going to talk about the most interesting part, which is meal accountability. Come on, a little enthusiasm 
Yeah, I went to a wake here. I thought it was great when I heard it because, you know, some of the stuff you don't even think, because we're not out there thinking like that. Okay, meal accountability. We do it every day, right? Do it every day? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to go over now is not just in preparation for the AR, but it is to go over a review of what we do every day. This is stuff we do every day, but we got to make sure we do it like uh, second nature by the time the auditors show up in some of your schools. Yes? Yes. Okay. So the first thing I want to go over is the criteria they give us for <clears throat> performance standard number one. And I want to read it because I want to make sure you understand it. I will refer to it later in the presentation back to this slide. What is it? All free, reduced, and paid meals claimed for reimbursement which we do, right? We claim all of our meals for reimbursement, are served only to children eligible for free, reduced, and paid meals, respectively. Meals are counted and recorded. Where does that happen? In the cafeteria. Okay? So the first part is you. Meals are counted and recorded, consolidated and reported. That happens in the office with Alice, right? Through a system which consistently yields correct claims which, if used correctly, the system you use in the cafeteria, should contribute to then joining in in the office with our other system in sending a correct claim. That's the most important thing, that we only claim the correct meals in the correct eligibility. That is intricate to the job we do every day. Just like it is serving a delicious lunch, that's the second most important thing. At least in this meeting. I don't know what they'll tell you in the other meetings, but at least here. Okay, the free reduced Paid lunch counts must not exceed the number of eligible students for that. And the free and reduced paid lunch counts must not exceed the number of attendance adjusted eligible students. You know, once in a while you will get a call from food and nutrition staff saying about that exception report, okay? Saying that you exceeded that adjusted and then sometimes it's because the attendance was not correct because they were tardy instead of absent, da, 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 right? You know that you have to document that information. That's what they mean there. We adjusted eligible students. Okay, so here we have a picture of one of our registers with a student at the keypad, right? So each student must have his or her meal ID number for breakfast and lunch. And they are the owners, the sole owners. Just like the Social Security, you're the only owner, they should be the only owner of that student ID number. Or PIN in a few cases, but we're mostly moving to student ID. We refer to it as student ID, now they're calling it ID Ready. It's nothing else but the student ID. But in some cases, the kids know it by ID Ready. Okay? <clears throat> the student is the owner of the ID or the PIN and is the only authorized one to enter on POS. Uh, we will discuss some special circumstances, but that is the prime uh, information. If the student has special needs, we all know that somebody can assist them, right? A teacher, a paraprofessional can come with them to the line and they can assist for them to enter the, the, the number, right? Or they sit at the table, and sometimes the paraprofessional gets the meal, right? And, that, and they assist the student because of their limitation. That is allowed. Later on, Ms. Frida is gonna be sending a survey when these circumstances happen in your school, because we do need to notify the DOA about these things. So there's no surprises of how we're doing accountability, okay? If that is not said, the expectation is that only the student is the one putting their number on the keypad. You got me? So that's why it's important that you know we, we recognize that. All free reduced paid breakfast and lunch claim for reimbursement must be served only to the approved eligible student. I've said that already like three different ways, but it's the same concept. Only to the eligible student. The sibling cannot let the other one borrow the number because they're not gonna be in school and, and eat, right? Even though they have the same eligibility, that's still not correct. All right? <clears throat> Cashiers. Cashier job is a big job, okay? And not everybody's cut out to be a cashier, all right? Not everybody can be a cashier because they gotta be, gotta be with it. They gotta be looking at that train, gotta be looking at the kid, they gotta be smiling, right? they gotta be asking for a second identifier. That is a requirement. They either have to ask the student, what is your name? Or the student says, my name is Angie. 
okay? And you check what the name on the display is. In some cases, now we have pictures on the display of some schools, but the cashier has to look at the picture and look at Angie to see that it looks like it's Angie, all right? Not that it looks like it's Juan, okay? At the, and that happens, laugh, but it happens, okay? So a cashier, pivotal position in the, in the, in the cafeteria. They gotta be with it. They gotta know what's going on, all right? They can't be there. <laughs> you laugh, I'm exaggerating, but some of them are kind of like awake, uh, asleep at the wheel. Oh, yeah. You gotta be awake at the wheel. Okay, that's an important wheel they're driving. All right? So those are the, the second identifiers that the cashiers need to look for. Databases. Super important all the time, but very important this year because it's a requirement. You know your procedure says you gotta run a database every week. And I want you to keep it. You can choose the day you want to do it, that's fine. But every week you gotta run it and keep it in a file. The second one is a requirement for the AR. You have to run a database the last day of the month, okay? So in October, the last day of the month is Monday, October 31st. So on that day, you gotta run that database, okay? Elementary, K-8, you do it by homeroom. Secondary school, you do it by alpha. Right? Everybody knows that. Those are the dates. I'm going to put this on the web page anyway. Ms. Frida's going to send you an email. There's no reason why you're not going to have an alert when you got to run that monthly database, but that is a requirement. And you must keep them in a file in the cafeteria. Who here had the AR last year, last, three years ago? Who here was a... Okay. Did they ask for the database when they were in the school? They do. And then you call me. And now Ms. Botero has to figure it out, and I, I die because I want to give you that database to have in the school. So I have to figure it out. And sometimes it's not, not so easy to do, okay? So please, this is something simple for you to have. What to do if the power is out, okay? Normally we tell you have your database available, all right? Uh, announce this to your administration. Okay, you gotta let them know the cafeteria has no power because maybe the office has power. Maybe you don't have power, but they have power, okay? If it's the whole school, then they'll come, come and tell you why. You meet in the hallway. But, um, so if possible, you will use the database to check off the kids. It's impossible. If it is not possible because it's last minute, you're a very large school, they all come like, you know, together, then you call the help desk and we'll give you further instructions what to do, okay? You find your coordinator or you call the help desk or me and we'll tell you what to do. Right? Now, this procedure about what, what happens when the power fails, everybody in the cafeteria needs to know what the procedure is. Your cashiers, your servers, your stock person, everybody in the cafeteria needs to know. Because when the auditors do come, they will ask the person washing pots, what happens when the power goes out? Rita's washing the pots in the water. That's the manager. Okay. And their answer is, well, the manager can't be here all the time, which is true. And who knows who's going to have to make that decision what to do. And you don't want to be like this. And you can't find Luann because Luann is in transit and she's not answering the phone. And everybody panics. So what is the way not to panic? A lot of the stuff I'm going to tell you today, three points. It's for you to know and to also transmit it to all your employees. So everybody knows. Education. Right? Okay. Uh, okay. Overlay. My beautiful register there, my Alana register. <laughs> so, uh, when do we prepare the overlay? I love this answer. The other group didn't tell me. Only one or two people told me. The day before, right? Because on the day before, you've already done your beautiful planning for the following day. You know what you had left over from today. You know if you got a different delivery, what you had to substitute it for. So you know what you're gonna serve the next day, or you should, right? By the afternoon before. You never know what's gonna happen that morning. So you have to leave it done the day before. That is the correct procedure, and that's what you should be doing. Okay, include the leftovers and any additional items you need to do. Okay, cashier. <clears throat> Another super important one. Cashiers need to know they have to enter every item on the tray, okay? And they also need to know that they cannot make up an item on the register to make the meal, force the meal to be reimbursable. 
We all know it happens. The auditors call it ghost items because it's a ghost on the tray or the plate, right? It's not there. You know, she put broccoli, but the broccoli. Right? So it's a ghost. So the cashiers need to know that they can't do that. That is a no no, that is a failure right there. That's going to be an automatic failure. If we don't, if we ring up an item that is not there, <coughs> it's going to be a failure for the audit for that school. So, you need to start instructing your cashiers now. You need to stand behind them now. Observe them. Are they ringing up the items? Because the day of the audit, Jenny, correct me if I'm wrong, the auditor will start be, stand behind that cashier yes. and they will observe what they're putting on the, on the, on the Alana. Yes. The cashier is not used to that and, and worse, if she's used to putting ghosts, she is just going to freeze. Okay, she's just going to melt. So, why? Now, you have time, you instruct them, you stand behind them, let's go over this procedure, what you need to do, how you need to ring up. You all know how to cashier because you stood there and you've had to do that, right? So, you can pass on, you know, that knowledge to them. You have to identify the student. I started by telling you that's not an easy job, right? The cashier has to be a record job. Have money in their account, uh -huh. and they only get, they only want to have whatever they want, like pizza. They only want pizza. It's not the Well, you can encourage them, honey. If you add uh, broccoli and you add um, exactly. right a salad or something, it will it will charge. You know, it will come out of your account. But if the child insists that he only wants the pizza, then you just give him the pizza. And they say, I only, I only want the pizza. Money, I only want pizza. I don't want waste food. That's okay. That's that you have to comply. You encourage them and you instruct them and you coach them. But if absolutely at the end I only want the slice of pizza, then you only want the slice of pizza. It's a la carte. That is not a reimbursable meal. What I'm talking about here is a tray or plate. I have a game at the end, but if I can. So, I have a plate and a tray, right? And he's got the pizza, and he's got a milk. Okay? Cashier rings it up. Is he going to charge? Yes. yes. What's missing? All guys get a price right now, right? <laughs> now, the cashier makes up the gold diet. She, she, she punches in juice or, or fruit or broccoli just to force the tray to be reimbursable. That tray, in, in reality, is not reimbursable and we cannot claim it to the federal government as a reimbursable meal. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. So, beginning with your servers. Your servers need to know they got to start already coaching the kid when they're putting the items on the tray what to make sure that, re that meal will be reimbursable by the end, right? So, like, the servers need to know what they're putting. And then the cashier needs to absolutely know what a meal, a reimbursable meal is. What constitutes a reimbursable meal? Don't rely on the register only. They gotta rely on the brain cells, okay? Because if the, if the meal in that case is not reimbursable, in that case the cashier would go, honey, if you take some fruit or a juice, then your meal will be reimbursable, right? And chances, nine times out of 10, they go, okay, I'll have an apple slice. And then have them in, within the reach of the cashier, Items like that, that could complement and make the meal reimbursable at that point. At that point, you're correct putting all the items. Right? So it's a team. It's a team effort. Okay. We already covered that. Meals that are taken to the classroom. And I'm going to consolidate this with, I have another slide for if you're sending meals to CSI. Okay, you're almost like field trips too. Meals outside of the dining room, right? We have various ways to account for them. Who here has meals outside of the dining room? Okay, yeah, I know you have everything. Okay, so in some cases we have installed NetPOS. Uh, right, Jenny, you have NetPOS in the classroom or no? The NetPOS where the, the students, the, the teachers enter the, the accounts for the kids? No. Okay. All right, but in some schools we have, and we can install that in your school if it's possible, 
in the computer for the teacher, we put a program that's called NPOS. And it will bring up the student list, and if the kid consumes the meal, they'll just click, it's just a check for an X. You know, it's super, super easy, okay? And that would be substituting the roster, okay? So that's one way. Second way is the meals go out of the classroom, and they must go with the classroom worksheet, right? Or the roster, call it the roster too, right? So off the meals go, off the roster goes, they end up in the classroom, the teacher <coughs> checks off, right? As she gives Rita her meal, right, Olga her meal, they check off the roster. They sign it, they return it to the office, correct? To you, they return it to you. Then you, what do you do first? Excellent answer. The first thing you do is you check it against attendance to make sure that a kid that got checked off was not absent. That's strike number one that you need to find out what happened, all right? After the attendance is confirmed, then you give it to your cashier, she goes outside, or he, and puts the meals in the register, right? Right. Okay. Then uh, she's putting it, putting it in, and off, off comes the coach or a teacher. I need a bag of ice because so-and-so failed. And can you give me a bag of ice? And she stops her bag of ice, interrupts her trend of thought, goes, because this is what we do, goes to get the bag of ice. Here, Ms. Rita, Ms. Teacher, I hope the kid is okay, whatever, right? Uh -huh. And then she doesn't remember where she stopped or left off. So for that reason, when she finishes, you run the meal report data, you, con you compare that to the worksheet to make sure she entered correctly, or she could have made a mistake with the number two for you, okay? So you need to check that against that. Now, those meals are confirmed, and they can stay in the claim to be reimbursed. Good, questions? No, move on. <laughs> CSI, similar. Same thing, they're going to the front office, send a list, or the assistant principal can write it on a piece of paper, the student ID, the name of the student, checked off as he gets the meal, and then that comes back to you, you check it in attendance, and you check it after it's entered on the register, same thing. If the student spill me, spills, spills the meal or drops it on the floor, which happens, we have non-reversible meal special programs that you're to put in your graphic POS, so you know they're there, the, the, the cashiers can ring them up if that's the case. Second meal, important that we do sell the students a second meal because it means revenue, right? But if a student wants a second meal, they can. We just can't claim reimbursement. That's why we put it differently, right? And those are the prices, which you know. Students with no money. It's easy. No fret about it. No fret about it. It's easy. Students with no money. I know it's a headache, but we have a lot of safety nets to handle this. Lots. Now, can things through still fall? Yes, they do. But you're all super professional people that know how to handle it. So you can. All right. What is the first thing? Every day, you run balance reports, right? And you bring these to the office. That is in the procedure that we have developed for this. The principal starts to know which kids, and he should give this to the teacher so they know which kids have balance or they don't have balance or are negative. We're getting to the negative, right? So if they already are, I'm in an elementary right now. If they already are at the five days, they're at the limit. That child, because you provided that roster, should not even enter the line, right? You need to have discussed already with your principal, but it's still October 12 only. If you haven't done it, you still have an opportunity to do it now. Make an appointment and determine, so you're on the same page with them, what is the student with no money policy, okay? You go over our procedure, they need to support you, what is he going to do, how is he going to help you, <coughs> da, da, da. That's normally what should happen. So if it hasn't happened, make it happen. You still have time. Not on March. Not in March. Now, okay, we still have time. We're on October 12th, all right? So, so those students with no money should not even enter the line. They should be on a side, right? And you bring the alternate meal, okay? Now, if it is, well, that should happen. No, because the teachers, they don't care. They put the feet on the line, and the little one, they go and grab the lunch. And you cannot, you can't take it back. Okay, they, okay, hello, hang on, calm down, calm down. If that happens, what should happen? Who can give me the answer what should happen? The little kid, I said there are some things that are going to fall through the cracks. But that is because the safety net broke. 
That is because somebody is not doing what they need to be doing. So you would address that with the principal first to fix it. But let's say the kid is there with the tray and he's exhausted. He doesn't have any money. What happens? How should that cashier, what do you instruct your cashier to do? Thank you, Dolores. This child should be referred to go see the manager. Okay? Honey, take your tray and go see the manager. The okay? manager is busy. No, you can't be busy at lunch. At lunch, you are at lunch on the floor. Let me tell you the story. One is the employee. No, you do not. You stop what you're doing and you go and tend to this problem. Or you solve the problem with your principal ahead of time. We said, in your case, the safety net broke because the information is being given to the school. They just are not helping you, not to put the kids on the lot. Okay, I gotta, I gotta move on, okay? I am telling you what to do. You stop, you take care of the child, you call the mom or the dad, and you go, we're going to give them lunch. However, you are at the negative. Mom, you have gotten a connected call every Monday. Every Monday, the district, we send the district a list, and they get a call. Number two. You have been getting either a call or a notification from the office because I have been providing a list with a negative balance for the student. Safety net number two. Okay, third, you can always come to pay in the cafeteria. You don't have to use, but you can use pay pounds. So you are giving them lots of options to comply. However, I am going to give your child a meal and you, and you enter the meal. You're just going to be short. If it's a paid or a reduced kid, you're going to be short and you're going to explain why you're short. Okay? And you ask the mom next day to bring the account up to date. Next day comes and it's not up to date. What do you do? You refer to administration. Now it becomes a discipline issue or a neglect issue. It could be a neglect issue from the home. Okay? Let's not assume it's just a kid trying to be fun. Okay? It could be also that the parents are not a little second grader doesn't know any better. Right? So it could be in that case a neglect issue. Okay? So we have given you various alternatives to deal with it. In a secondary, it's just slightly different. There is no negative. <laughs> Funny middle school grader gets to the line and he's like, well, I don't have any money, but you know, I already ate half my sandwich. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> Go see the manager. The manager will call the mom and dad or dad. Try to get him on the phone. Tell him what happened. Okay. You will ring up that meal because he consumed the meal. And he is eligible for that meal, even if it's at a pay, whatever status they have. You deal then with administration. If it's one of these funny bunny kids that I'm like, I got you. You call the assistant principal in charge of the cafeteria and you tell him I have a situation. I need you to resolve. They are there. We have to work in a team in unison. You can't work without them. They cannot work without you. Okay, so we got to work together. Right? I covered all the different scenarios and areas of what you can do. Okay, continuing on. I'm not going to elaborate on field trips because it's the same as meal outside the classroom except it's before 10 or after 10. It's procedure B05, okay? I wasn't planning on covering in great detail. You know you have to do the WAN in order to get your updates, to get the money in the kids' accounts, okay, that work with pay pants. So you've got to do the one every day. CRCRs. You must complete CRCRs to correct. This is an avenue we have allowed to correct data, okay? But it must be done carefully and timely. You have to do it between 24 to 48 hours of the event. Not a week later, not a month later, okay? That is way too long, and you have not gotten credit for any of that. Those meals give credit to you. Whether it's a breakfast, it's a lunch, or it's a snack, it goes to credit the cafeteria. If they're not accounted for properly, either through the register or through a CRCR, you're not getting credit for it. So it's like if we put them food in the trash can, okay? As far as anything, reimbursement, uh, meals per labor hours, everything. So please pay attention to that. You also need to use a CRCR for any discrepancy over or under of $10. Even if you do not know what, the, what happened, at least you looked and you can't find it, some days you can't find it, some days, oh my God, I forgot that $5 bill or what, you know, that happens, right? But if you look and look and you don't know, you still do a CRCR and say, I am over 1750, I look, but I cannot find why the discrepancy, okay? So you still have to document. 
employee meals. It's allowed, every employee can have a meal, they have an account, record the meal correctly in their account. After school meals, we have many after school programs and they are as vital to our program as breakfast and lunch, as vital. The meals we serve in the afternoon are after school meals, in some cases are snacks, but the majority are after school meals. They contribute to your operation as much as a breakfast and a lunch, okay? So you need to put them in timely, the next morning after breakfast, according to the procedure and the special program number, you put them in, right? And we're testing a different, a little bit of a different way to do it, but I'm not gonna go over that. It's gonna be a little bit easier. Um, and you record the number. What document do you use to, re to document the number that you put in your special program? What documentation supports that 50? Okay, the order and verification and form FM6118, which is the roster, we call it the roster, with the names of the kids on the left, and the after school people put an X or an A, and a one or a zero, right? If the after school meal is served, correct? That is the document, that is like your point of sale for that snack. It sounds like Santa. All right, so that is the documentation that you have in place of a register. The FM6118, okay? Extend the day. They got a little bit different procedure because they're serving a bigger population. Do I have how many extended day I have here? Okay. So there's three different ways. They can use the NEPOS in the classroom, which we do have a couple on it. You send the rosters, right? And the teacher crosses off the names of the kids that are absent, then signs them and gives them to you. Or in other cases, they come to the dining room and they get their bag, you know, with their after school meal, if the administration allows. You don't have to go with the administration. And then this is the form that you would use to document the entry, okay? How many you, they order, how many were received, and how many were served is what is left over. If they eat in the dining room, okay? The extended day only have that other possibility. It's in the procedure for the extended day member, okay? If you need to have me go over it a little bit more, you know, in detail, I can do that. Okay, this is just a beautiful picture I received. And it's an after school program we just started at Arcola Lake and it's called Embrace Girls. And this is where it goes home, right? A lot of you don't see when the kids sit down and they have their after school meal. And look at them, they're doing their homework. I know the pictures are fuzzy, but they're doing their homework and they're eating their after school meal. And that just completes their day. You know, that's, that's what we're all about. We start their day and we end their day. 